Good afternoon, everybody, and you're very welcome to this IIEA webinar with uh, Dennis Dalton, uh, the editor, the London editor of the Irish Times. I'm Dahio Kalik, and I'm the chair of the UK group uh, in the Institute. Uh, I don't think I need to introduce Dennis. He's well known to all. Uh, he's been a very acute observer of politics uh, in the UK uh, since he arrived in London, I think about six, seven years ago now. And uh, Dennis, it's nice to see you, nice to welcome you, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Dahi, and it's a great pleasure to, uh, to join you at the Institute. Uh, your work is incredibly valuable, and uh, certainly to me, and I know to uh, everybody else who's interested in, in these matters. I thought before we talk about the race itself, it might be worth just going back a few minutes to uh, how we got here. And the, uh, the proximate uh, trigger was uh, the Chris Pincher affair a couple of weeks ago. And so one way of looking at it is that if Chris Pincher had not got drunk in the Carlton Club two weeks ago, then we wouldn't be where we are. Uh, but what Chris, the Chris Pincher affair did was it was a kind of the, the last straw. And it was, uh, you know, in terms of Boris Johnson's character, because of the fact that he had sent his various ministers out to, uh, to, to give versions of the facts which turned out not to be true in terms of what he had known about Pincher and Pincher's behaviour. And so that kind of uh, you know, was part of a long succession of, uh, of pieces of evidence about Johnson's character and the way in which his character and his relationship with the truth was becoming a problem for his relationship with his colleagues and for his standing in the country. But before the Pincher affair, just a week earlier, the Conservatives had lost two by-elections, one to Labour in Yorkshire, another to the Liberal Democrats in, uh, in Devon. And, uh, and they were the latest in a series of electoral uh, mishaps and lost by-elections. And just before that, Boris Johnson had had a vote of confidence in his leadership where 148 of his own MPs had voted against him. And, uh, and so that was 41% of the MPs. And so there was all of this kind of drumbeat going where Boris Johnson's position was becoming uh, more and more unstable. And so if the Pincher affair hadn't triggered this now, then it's likely that something would have happened a little bit later, and particularly from the moment that uh, he had fared so badly in the confidence vote, it was clear that the writing was on the wall. But the other thing that had been going on throughout the previous years was that within uh, Downing Street and within the government, there was an ideological dispute going on. And Rishi Sunak referred to this in his resignation letter, where he spoke about the fact that the two of them were supposed to uh, be making a joint economic speech uh, or a speech in the economy the following week, and that uh, differences had arisen, which he found to be insurmountable. And this goes back in a way to Boris Johnson's achievement in 2019, where he realigned British politics and he managed to get this uh, 80 seat majority by appealing both to former Labour voters in the so called Red Wall and traditional Conservative voters in uh, the uh, south and the southeast of England. And he did this uh, you know, in the election by majoring on Brexit and on, uh, being, on not being Jeremy Corbyn. And, uh, and then, uh, but then once he was in power, he had to govern in a way that pleased both parts of this constituency. And so he had to, on the one hand, appeal to these new voters who uh, were generally on lower incomes than the average and uh, or than his, his other voters and were more dependent on well-funded public services. But he also wants to appeal to the traditional Conservative voters who wanted low taxes. And uh, his answer to this was, as he put it himself, his policy on cake, which was that he was in favour of having it and in favour of eating it. And, uh, and this, uh, you know, these tensions began to emerge, but then they were suppressed to some extent by the coronavirus pandemic, where there was so much money going out the door and nobody was really asking too many questions. But people in the, in the Treasury were getting increasingly uncomfortable about all this, uh, these demands on the exchequer and the fact that it was becoming more and more difficult to say no to demands uh, for more cash. And so, uh, so, so, so these tensions had, had, had already started to emerge between Sunak and, uh, and Johnson. And we're seeing something of this ideological and policy difference playing out now in the, uh, in the contest. So if we go back to this uh, contest, 
And uh, in the sort of later stages of the MPs uh, section of the contest, you had uh, two candidates from the ideological right. You had Suella Braverman representing the hardline Brexiteers, the so-called Spartans, who had voted against uh, Theresa May's deal and all of its uh, votes. And you had Kemi Badenoch representing the right-wing element of the culture wars and, 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 and uh, majoring on that. You were two clean break candidates in the person of Tom Tugendhat, who had never held ministerial office, and Penny Mordaunt, who had uh, only held a junior ministry. And then you had two establishment candidates, Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss. They had been in senior positions in Boris Johnson's government throughout. Rishi Sunak just left uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Liz Truss remained. And, uh, and Liz Truss then immediately presented herself as being, in a way, the Boris Johnson loyalty candidate, if not exactly the continuity candidate. And so she has been at pains to say that she had remained loyal. And Boris Johnson's most, uh, most zealous uh, loyalists in the person of Nadine Dorries and, uh, and Jacob B. Smog immediately came out and said that Liz Truss, although she had been a Remainer in the 2016 referendum, was in fact more of a Brexiteer than they ever were, and they fully backed her. And she then uh, was the beneficiary of this, uh, of Johnson's kind of betrayal narrative, which was uh, ventilated, uh, particularly in the Daily Mail, which was suggesting that uh, Sunak was the assassin who had been plotting for some time to, uh, to topple Johnson, and that she then was his, uh, his, his only inheritor. And so that she, and she was their, their standard bearer. Sunak uh, wasn't really able to present himself as a complete clean break in the sense that uh, he, first of all, had been so closely associated with Johnson and his policies. He had put up with an awful lot of Johnson's uh, behavior for a number of years. And also, like Johnson, he was uh, he received a fine for breaking coronavirus rules. Uh, it was a fairly harmless breach in that uh, Sunak had showed up early for a meeting and then suddenly Boris's birthday cake arrived. But nonetheless, he couldn't really get on his high horse about this, given that he and Johnson had actually received uh, the same fine for the same event. And of course, uh, Liz Truss was also unable to really dissociate herself in, on moral grounds from Johnson, partly because she didn't want to, uh, but also just, uh, you know, she was so complicit. And so what you found is that already, even at this stage, the uh, contest has become one, not so much about character, uh, but actually mostly about ideology. And it's particularly about this question of policy and what you do about, uh, about the economy. And in this, Rishi Sunak is presenting himself as a Thatcherite to uh, Liz Truss's Reaganite. And uh, so uh, invoking Nigel Lawson and the early period of Margaret Thatcher's uh, period in office, Rishi Sunak is saying that uh, he also wants to cut taxes, but that, uh, that inflation is the big enemy and that it's important that uh, you get inflation under control, that uh, the Conservatives remain fiscally responsible, and that uh, they don't start cutting taxes until such time as it's responsible to do so. What Liz Truss is saying is that actually this is stifling growth and that the way to go about this is that actually you borrow to cut taxes and the tax cuts will stimulate the economy generate growth, and that in turn will generate revenues. She's also suggested that the coronavirus debt, about £311 billion, should be treated like war debt, and so you would put it uh, on, say, a 50-year term, which would imply that you would refinance it. And uh, so she's, uh, her policies have alarmed uh, a lot of mainstream economists, and she's also alarmed people by uh, questioning uh, the uh, mandate of the Bank of England. She hasn't suggested that the Bank of England should no longer be independent, but she has said that maybe it's time to look at their mandate again. And she cited the example of the Bank of Japan as being something they could look at. And so, uh, so, so this is uh, essentially where the battle is being fought. The other part of it then is to some extent about personality and about background. And uh, Liz Truss is making a lot of the fact that she uh, went to a comprehensive school, that she comes from uh, a kind of ordinary background. And, uh, and it is, there's no question but that if you talk to conservative MPs 
and members of the party, they will report that a lot of Conservative members, while they don't disapprove of Rishi Sunak's wealth, they feel as if it makes his life remote from theirs. And that, uh, and because his wealth is on such a scale, he and his wife are worth something like £750 million, according to the Sunday Times Rich List. And, uh, and then there have been these questions about his wife's tax status. They appear to be more or less uh, sorted out now. But nonetheless, uh, you know, all of this, and uh, once again, the Daily Mail, which has been very much uh, campaigning on behalf of Liz Truss, has stories every day uh, with a photograph of some shoe that uh, Rishi Sunak is wearing and the fact that it costs £495. And uh, his suit, apparently, today, we hear it costs 3500 And all of this is, uh, you know, is kind of part of the case against Rishi Sunak. The case in favour of Sunak, is that he would make himself, is that he would win an election. And the polling suggests that uh, he would be better placed to defeat Labour than uh, Liz Truss would. And uh, he will also, over the next couple of weeks, start to, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, step up a lot of these attacks on the fact that Liz Truss was originally a member of the Liberal Democrats and that she also was a very... Um, articulate advocate of remaining in the European Union in the uh, 2016 referendum. Rishi Sunak is a conviction Brexiteer. He, uh, as a, a fairly new MP, uh, he, it is true that he was taking the risky option uh, by uh, defying David Cameron and George Osborne by going for the, uh, for the Brexit side. He believes that there is an economic case for Brexit and that the way in which you can make Brexit work is that uh, is through divergence in particular areas. And the areas that he has identified particularly are in data, so that you uh, so that Britain could move ahead in AI uh, through um, a more liberal data regime than uh, GDPR, and uh, then also in uh, the area of life sciences, that it would be uh, easier to um, to introduce uh, patents. And uh, and then also in um, in and to do clinical trials, and then particularly in the area of financial services. And so uh, the, he's got a big push on in terms of uh, financial services regulation, and essentially to have a kind of a second big bang in the city of London through deregulation. And so uh, what he's talking about uh, is really focusing on a number of areas, high value areas of the economy where deregulation can make a difference and where Britain uh, can actually scale up to the, uh, you know, and use its strengths, it's already strong in some of these areas, uh, to actually have a proper competitive rivalry with the European Union. But then that would imply being a bit more relaxed about other regulations. And so you, uh, you, know, you only diverge when it makes sense. And if it makes sense to remain um, aligned to EU rules and some things, then you would do so. And so, he's, uh, so, so uh, where he's concerned, uh, he, does, uh, he is absolutely convinced about Brexit. He's not, I think, uh, a kind of, uh, you know, he also believes in the sovereignty argument, but he's not looking for uh, trouble. In a sense, he's not looking for a scrap, and uh, and in the internal uh, discussions within the government on uh, the approaches to dealing with the European Union, particularly over the Northern Ireland Protocol, he, along with Michael Gove, was among those who was inclined to urge caution rather than confrontation, on the basis that confrontation could have uh, an economic cost. But it's worth noting when we start to talk about how this would affect uh, Britain's relations with Ireland and with the European Union, that all of the candidates in the leadership election, including people on the liberal wing of the party like Tom Tugendhat, uh, backed the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. All of them are in favour of it. And I think if you look at some of the sounds that are coming out of Dublin and out of some of the European capitals, which are kind of suggesting that uh, we'd all much prefer Rishi Sunak than Liz Truss. Well, first of all, that's obviously extremely helpful to Liz Truss's campaign to make these noises. But also, I think uh, there's a danger of um, setting expectations too high, because I think that there's no question but that Liz Truss will find it more difficult to retreat from uh, her position on the Northern Ireland Protocol, partly because she's the author of it, 
but also because the people who brought her to the dance were the uh, Eurosceptics of the European Research Group. And so she's more beholden to them than uh, Rishi Sunak would be. But it's also true that uh, if the Europeans think that Rishi Sunak is going to come into office and is going to somehow pause or withdraw the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, then I think that's an illusion. And I think it's probably useful to think about the function of this legislation in diplomatic terms. And so it's just passed its stages in the, uh, in the Commons and it's going to the House of Lords. Uh, there's a, the, uh, the Lords are only back for a very short period in September and then it'll meander quite slowly through the Lords in the autumn and the winter. But it would be quite ambitious even to expect it to be uh, passed by the end of this year. So it's probably going to go into next year there's a good sign that, that it'll come, that it'll, there'll be some turbulence in the Lords because there are a lot of people over there who, A, know an awful lot about this sort of thing and B, are quite old fashioned about the rule of law and uh, treaty breaking. And uh, so, uh, so, so while all of this is going on, the function of the legislation is mainly to influence the negotiations. And the idea, like all of these previous actions, is to somehow attract the attention of the Europeans. It's usually what Britain is trying to do is to attract the attention of the member states that usually backfires on them. But uh, nonetheless, it's to try to, to attract their attention and say, will you please loosen uh, Maris Sefcovic's mandate so that uh, we can have a more, we can have a little bit more, uh, uh, some kind of a, a renegotiation of the, of the treaty. Uh, I would say that where Sunak is concerned, he might not be quite so hung up on whether the treaty is actually rewritten or not. But nonetheless, uh, I think that, that uh, you know, he will need to have some kind of victory. Uh, he can't simply uh, fold his tent, I think, and, uh, and retreat. And so uh, if, say, one of these people... So in a sense, you know, I, I suppose what I'm saying is that they're both going to face the same set of circumstances if they come in, which is that both of them will want probably to reset the relationship with the European Union. The European Union, which didn't really feel like offering much in, by way of concessions to Boris Johnson because he was too weak to do anything with it, might be more interested in having a more serious conversation with the new leader. But either way, uh, it's hard to see how, with the Conservative Party as it is, that without some kind of, uh, of, of movement, at least, uh, you know, and something that looks quite dramatic in terms of its impact on the ground, uh, how you can actually really make progress. It really brings me to the last thing I was going to say about all of this, which is that whoever uh, wins this, uh, this leadership contest is going to have an awful lot of trouble with the Conservative Parliamentary Party. Uh, Rishi Sunak got more votes than anybody else in the leadership uh, contest for the MPs uh, yesterday. But uh, he got 137 votes. That's 38% of the votes. In 2019, at the same stage, Boris Johnson got 50% or 51%. And Theresa May uh, in 2016 got more than 60%. But Theresa May wasn't able to manage the Conservative Party. David Cameron wasn't able to manage his party. And it was because of that difficulty in party management that we had the, uh, the referendum. Boris Johnson purged many of his critics within the parliamentary party and went on to, to win an 80 seat majority. And he wasn't able to manage the Conservative Party. Whether it's Liz Truss or, uh, or Rishi Sunak, most of their MPs will not have voted for them. And that is going to be a real difficulty when it comes to them trying to do anything. And it's going to be a particular difficulty when it comes to trying to make progress on the protocol. And I think I'll leave it at that and see what, uh, what you all want to talk about.